everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Dan Bromberg. I'm a professor in the Department of Political Science and the Carsey School of Public Policy. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about my research today that um, is not on COVID-19, so we have a bit of a reprieve for, for the next 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll kind of get started, and I'll give you a, a, just a lay of the land a bit. Um, as we're on Zoom, you're welcome to put questions into the chat box. The chat box is typically on the bottom of your screen. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll open it up for um, for uh, Q&A, and um, we'll see kind of you know where we get to and what conversations we have. Um, these are always hard to determine who's going to be watching. So uh, if there are students on there, I'm happy to answer questions around just doing research about um, you know following kind of a career path into academia or anything along those lines. Uh, if there are people that are more interested in the research itself, I'm happy to answer questions um, about the research methodology or any of our findings. Um, so feel free to throw anything into that box. I'm joined by a few of my colleagues and they're gonna help us sort that out as we move forward. Um, so once again, so welcome. We're uh, glad that you're able to join us and hopefully this uh, is somewhat enjoyable for you. Um, so we, we we kind of start with this idea of the social contract. Um, and this presentation today is about body-worn cameras, but really it's about something deeper than that. And I think starting with the social contract is something that uh, really frames the discussion. So in exchange for granting police officers the right power and responsibility to use force, citizens expect police to only exercise force when it's necessary and to only use the amount of force that is reasonable, proportional, and necessary for that situation, right? So this is kind of that, that founding contract that we think of um, between residents of a community and police officers. And this is not to say that this has actually been broken over the last decade or two decades or three decades, um, but there certainly have been incidents over the last, uh, you know, well, few decades, but certainly over the last decade or so that uh, people have started to question uh, whether or not officers are using reasonable and proportional force. Um, and what, what that brought about was this idea of body-worn cameras as being a pretty prevalent uh, tool to help uh, solve some of these issues. So this is from the ACLU. Right. So historically, there was no documentary evidence of most encounters between police officers and the public. And due to the volatile nature of those encounters, this often resulted in radically divergent accounts of its incidents. So cameras have the potential to be a win win, helping protect the public against this police misconduct and at the same time helping to protect the police against the false accusations of abuse. Right. And really, it was this perceived bidirectional benefit. Um, that has led to the rapid expansion of body-worn cameras, right? So both from the policing side and from uh, the civil liberty side, we are seeing uh, support for this, this new tool, right? This tool that uh, supposedly is going to lead to accountability and transparency. But I just wanted to give you kind of a lay of the land of the laws that are specific to body-worn cameras and then those that are applicable to body-worn cameras. And as you kind of look and scan across here, and you don't need to know this whole chart and I'm not gonna go over this whole chart, but you just could see that there's a patchwork of laws, right? They're not consistent across the board. Um, and you can actually see New Hampshire sticking out in this one column over here. So this is from the Urban Institute, by the way, um, sticking out in this one column over here. Um, exempts police from public records requests. So it's kind of this interesting uh, one situation where, where New Hampshire is quite unique in that, that circumstance. So the problem though, is that body cams and dash cams cannot be effective tools for accountability if the public can never see the images they capture, right? So this is, this is the problem that we're, we're looking to, to deal with. So what we're looking to do is aim to explain the drivers behind a police chief's decision to release BWC footage publicly of a fatal police encounter. All right, so when are they going to be transparent with this or not? 
Um, and a few caveats, right? It might not always be the right decision to release that, that body-worn camera footage, right? There might be instances where it makes perfectly you know, logical sense not to release that footage. So we're just looking at one sliver of this problem, and I would argue this is a much more complex problem than people assume. And that that simple win-win solution uh, actually takes any number of decisions um, and is laden with uh, uh, complexities. So what does it mean to be transparent? Right? What does it mean to assume transparency? Well, transparency is defined as the availability of information about an actor that allows other actors to monitor the workings or performance of the first actor. Right? So in this case, we're assuming that transparency means that citizens or residents of a community can then monitor the behavior of police officers. But obviously that's not the only instance of transparency. And certainly that's not the only group of people that police officers have to be transparent to, right? There are any number of different ways that transparency flows. Right, there's hierarchical transparency. So are you being transparent to your supervisor or to your subordinate? Right, there's downward transparency or people seeing what government is doing. Right, there's inward and there's outward transparency. Right, there's any different way to think about transparency, any number of different ways. So the assumption that simply law enforcement's duty to be transparent is just to those citizens, right, with the, that body-worn camera footage, is actually not true, right? Often, law enforcement needs to be transparent to possibly legal authorities or the courts, right, the justice system, but it may not be prudent to be transparent to citizens. Right? So it's extremely complex as to how this all works out. Right, and I'll, I'll go through this quickly, depending on who's you know, watching, you may have more or less interest in this, right? But essentially transparency works in any number of different ways, right? It could be something um, like bureaucratic transparency, right? Where there are different examples where different governments around the world have different um, reasons to uh, have procedures that are transparent. It could be public forums, right, for office holders. It could be freedom of information laws, right? It could be that everyone sees everything. Right, everyone sees what government does, and government sees what everyone does. Or it could be just surveillance. Right, that too is transparency, just not typically assumed with what we're talking about as transparency. Right, we have these kind of basic assumptions about transparency, and they're not necessarily correct. Like many assumptions are not. Right, there's this assumption that it conveys honesty and integrity, but transparency doesn't have to do that. But in those who assume that transparency will lead to accountability, they're confusing the normative, right, that which our democratic values lead us to believe in, with the analytical, that which social sciences allow us to claim, right? So what Fox is saying here is simply transparency doesn't necessarily lead to accountability. However, we've assumed that it does, and we expect that it does. Therefore, our actions that are dictated by that assumption. But in reality, there's nothing empirical that tells us that transparency will always lead to a form of accountability, which is what we're seeking with this tool of transparency. And in fact, right, one of the most interesting dynamics of transparency is that it actually may detract from our trust in our public officials. And this is Onur, Onur O'Neill, and I'll let you read that. This was a BBC Wright lecture in 2002. And at the end there, she says, increasing transparency can produce a flood of unsorted information and misinformation that provides little but confusion, unless it can be sorted and assessed. It may add to uncertainty rather than trust. Right, and we could think about that through the lens of body-worn cameras. We could think about that through complicated budgets that are, are transferred to the public. Are we able to see that footage on that body-worn camera, process it and assess it, and make a determination if what happened was always proper? And that's not to say that we can't sometimes, 
But it is to say that it is not always as straightforward as we might think. So what did we do? So our research. So we sent a survey out to over 6,000 police chiefs. Uh, we had about 1,000 start that. And then we ended up with about around 700 usable responses, um, which were a sample of police chiefs is, is a pretty good um, result. We use something called an experimental survey where we had a control group and we had a treatment group. And that control and treatment group both were given access to footage from a camera. These are training videos shared with us by a colleague in Montreal. Um, and in this, in this footage, in the control group, the police chiefs received just a body-worn camera. And in the treatment group, the police chiefs received both the body-worn camera and a smartphone footage of the same incident. And they both received a framing paragraph. And so what we're attempting to do is put them in a situation and have them respond to that situation. So I'll paraphrase here, but you're welcome to read. Right, essentially we said, a colleague in a neighboring town is using body-worn cameras. There was an incident. They're running a pilot program right now, and they're trying to figure out if they should release the footage. They've turned to you as a confidant for guidance. They've confidently, confidentially shared the video footage with you and asked whether or not they should release it to the public. So just to give you some context, some Police departments out there release footage immediately, and that's their policy. There are some departments that would uh, have an internal investigation first and then release the footage. There are some departments that might do a stylized version of the footage, right, where they actually have a narrator talking about what's happening. And there are others that don't release the footage unless there's a court order dictating that they have to release the footage. So what we tried to do with this paragraph was essentially say, look, there are no policies in place right now. What would you do here? What do you think we should do? The treatment group received essentially the same framing paragraph, other than what you could see here is that we added this line. Right, so the first video was captured by the cell phone of a bystander close to the incident. It is circulating online and being shown by local media outlets. So in this situation, the treatment group received both that body-worn camera and they received this cell phone captured by a bystander. And then we asked them these questions. Let me try to turn off my laser pointer here. We asked them these questions. Essentially, what would you do with this? I would not recommend releasing the footage. I would recommend releasing the raw footage of the encounter immediately. I would recommend releasing the raw footage of the encounter to the public once an internal investigation is over. And I would recommend releasing a stylized version of the footage of the encounter where a police officer narrates what is going on so that the public understands procedures. So essentially what we've done is we've kind of laid out a handful of the policies as to when officers typically would release footage. And we gave them those options. So just to give you a sense of what this looked like. So you have a smartphone camera on the left, you have a body worn camera on the right, same shot, same time. And then this is the incident. Body worn camera, you still see the officer's firearm is drawn. You hear the bullet, right? Or you hear the, the gun go off, but you actually don't see his partner standing to the, the right of him over there. Whereas with the smartphone camera you do, and if you notice this man is actually wielding an ax at this point, approaching the officers. We then were curious. So not only would this added information change a chief's behavior, but more importantly, we were looking at whether or not trust would change the chief's behavior in releasing the video. 
So we wanted to know if the chief's trust in citizens, the chief's trust in the media, or the chief's trust in his or her own organization would affect their willingness to release the video. So these were the questions that we asked around trust. So just to give you a sense, these are all tested scales. They've been in research for years now, um, and they all try to capture um, different elements of trust in one's department, trust in citizens, and trust in the media. These are on a scale of uh, zero, uh, zero to seven. And you'll see the average there is close to seven. Most of the chiefs that we uh, surveyed trusted their officers. Then we asked about trust in the media, and this is two slides here. And once again, their levels of trust are higher, right, when we average them out. They drop below four in certain areas, but still well above three, three and a half. And then trust in citizens. And once again, not quite as high as trust in their own department, but still pretty high. And overall 4.83, you know, so pretty high on that scale up to seven. Now our findings showed that there was no difference between the control and treatment group when we just look at their responses to the answers, right? No statistical difference, right? There are slight differences as far as when and how they would release, but overall they're, they're pretty comparable across both the control and treatment group. So whether or not they, that smartphone video is circulating or not, it really isn't gonna change the way that the chief is going to behave. However, trust does change the way that the chief is going to behave. And I'll go through how that looks. It does not affect the chief's behavior in the treatment video, or I'm sorry, in the treatment group. So once that body-worn camera is already circulating in the, the form of the smartphone, trust does not matter at all, right? The, the chief is going to behave the same way. However, if the trust is, if the chief is going to make the, the decision whether or not to release the video, meaning it's not seen by the public at all, then it does affect the chief's behavior. So here's the results of, of uh, it's called the multinomial regression. And I'll kind of go through it on the next slide in a bit clearer language. But for those of you interested in this, here, here you have it. And in this, what we, what we essentially have to do is something versus something else. We have to make up comparisons. So in this first comparison, we looked at not releasing footage versus releasing raw footage immediately. And what we found was that as the trust in citizens increases, the likelihood of releasing that raw footage increases by 48% as opposed to not releasing the footage. So the chief, if they trust the citizens within their town, they're more likely to release that raw footage immediately. Right? So an interesting intervening variable there of trust as far as whether or not footage will be made accessible. Next, looking at trust in one's own department. So releasing footage after an internal investigation versus releasing footage immediately, that raw footage. Trust in one's department, so the officers within one's department, increases the likelihood of releasing that raw footage immediately by 63%. That's a pretty big factor, right? That's a pretty big increase. So when a leader has trust in their organization, releasing that raw footage is not something that they're necessarily hesitant to do. And here's the last one I'll share with you. And it's the only one that actually shows the opposite. Trust in the media actually decreases the likelihood of releasing it immediately. And we did receive some comments along with all of these answers. So it open-ended questions. And essentially what we learned from this was that police chiefs essentially didn't feel the pressure to release that raw footage immediately 
if they knew the media was not going to immediately jump on uh, these issues, right? They felt like they had time to work through this internal investigation and then release it. So what does that mean, right? And from our perspective, what it means is this, that when there is discretion granted, trust is a significant predictor of behavior. So when a police chief is given that discretion to either release that video or not, that relationship that they have with both their own organization and the relationship they have with the citizens and the media within their community will affect their decision-making as far as how transparent they will be. And in some cases then, how the public deems them as being accountable. Right, so I'll just finish with this one more time. But then you kind of look at this patchwork and how all over the place it is. Right, and we have to remember that this relationship that's built between police officers and their communities, these are important factors when we don't have consistent policy and, and we're not going to, right? So these are important factors that we have to consider uh, when thinking about this issue. So thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, just so you get a sense on the bottom here, um, my colleague Etienne Charbonneau is uh, from Ecole Nationale de Administration Publica. Uh, he's the research chair, Canadian research chair in public management and um, the research chair actually funded uh, this project. So I just wanted to uh, make that well known. Um, and I'm happy to stop now and take any questions that may have come up and I will uh, stop my screen share. And if people want me to pop it back on, I could always do that. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box, but if you have one and want to share it, feel free. Yeah, if there's anyone, I mean, that we want to uh, open up their mics, I'm fine with that too. Looks like we have a civil group here that no one's going <laughs> to attack me. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please feel free. If not, I'm happy to uh, take emails or anything along those lines. I actually had a question about trust. It's interesting how, did they talk about how they measured trust as a factor? Um, so we did, right? I mean, we, so we measured trust. Um, so, and it was on that slide where essentially we said, so I could kind of um, pull it up again if you'd like. So let me just do this. Are you, you seeing my slideshow again? Yes. Okay. So this is how we measure trust. Um, so all of these indicators um, are essentially um, pooled together and averaged across the board. And there are different ways to analyze this. You could do it as a factor analysis, um, but essentially we ask the chiefs to answer, to rate on a scale of, of zero to seven each of these statements. And these are kind of tested and verified scales that have been used in the literature for, for years. Um, so you kind of go through the media one actually has the most. Right, so things like the frequency in w with which law enforcement is covered is adequate. The topic of law enforcement is covered on the necessary regular basis. And you kind of just go through and they're, they're really pretty straightforward statements. Uh, the people of the community we serve approach life with a strong moral code. People in the community we serve care about what happens to police officers. People in the community we serve are capable of policing themselves. Thanks, Dan. A couple of questions have come in. Can you talk sure. a little bit about New Hampshire's solitary standing WRT release of public records? Um, not not in particular, no. Um, so, could, so you want to just, who, so who, who asked that question? Uh, David Weber. David, you can probably unmute yourself if you want to. Or I can unmute you if you want. Okay, thank you. 
you yeah, go for it. Share, share, share what you know, and I'd be happy to kind of comment on it. I'm not um, super familiar with it, but um, so I don't want to obviously say things that I, I don't know. Um, but I'd be curious to hear what you have to say. Well, I don't, I don't know much either. That's why I asked the question. But I, um, there do seem to be cases where law enforcement and at least some citizens have a very different take on whether it's desirable for a particular material to come into the into public view or not. And that can apply to the release of records as well as to the release of video. So I just wondered what the what the discussion about that had been in New Hampshire that left us the only one of the 50 states that approaches that issue that way. Yeah, so I don't know the history of that. Um, I, I don't know the history of that discussion. Um, I think it is, you know, what I could kind of talk more broadly about is um, the, the variation across the United States. So even though that was kind of a public records exempt law, um, however, loads of states have now put in different laws governing um, specifically to body worn cameras. So the, the public records laws don't necessarily apply anyway. Um, and it often depends on uh, whether or not um, departments are classifying them as part of personnel files, right? Which has been an attempt to, to do over the years. Um, and if they could get them as part of personnel files, they can't be released. Um, obviously, if there are ongoing investigations, um, there are situations with, with releasing them. Uh, in North Carolina, for example, um, you essentially need to get a, a court order um, in many cases to get them released. Uh, so there is just so much variation. Um, and I think that's why, you know, we kind of point to this idea of discretion as being something that we should um, really think about, right? Whether or not we want that chief to have that discretion or not. Um, and I'm not suggesting one way or the other. Um, but it's certainly something we should consider with the amount of variation in the, the various regulations. We actually had some questions about the program, Dan. Do you want to hold that to later? Um, I don't care. I mean, either way, if there are any other questions about the research, I guess I could take them. If not, um, I'm happy to talk about the program. Program it is. Uh, so someone's interested in the program, uh, scholarships, tuition information, the program in general. Yeah, sure. Um, so we have three programs at the Carsey School. We have a Master's of Public Administration, uh, Master's of Public Policy, and a Master's of Community Development. Um, each of them uh, kind of give exposure to policymaking, I would say, in, in three different ways, right? Community development is much more of that ground up organizing. Uh, public administration is the implementation of the public policy. So often you'll see uh, police officers in our class, uh, firefighters in our class, um, you know, folks from the National Guard and then folks from the nonprofit sector as well. Um, and then the MPP, uh, the Masters of Public Policy is really about development of public policy, advocating and communicating public policy. Um, and each of our programs offer different funding models, right, as far as scholarships and tuition and waivers for classes. Um, so what I would say is your best bet is just to reach out, um, and we're happy to walk you through all of the components associated with them. I, I unmuted Dai. He's the person that had the question. So if he had something more specific. Sure. Was there anything else, Daya, that I could... Uh, Answer there specifically. Okay. Um, and Looks what like I would another say, question came in too um, from Claire. What is the takeaway from this that BWC are effective or not effective? And what is the relation you're making with regards to trust? Um, could you say that second part? What is the what in relation to trust? What is the correlation you are making with regards to trust? Um, so A, as far as effectiveness or not effective, I think the uh, you have to define um, what effective is. Um, if, you're, if you're talking about crime rates and things like that, um, I would argue that the findings are pretty mixed. They're all over the place. Um, if you're talking about holding someone accountable, as, if, if that's your measure of effectiveness, um, that I think what, what we're showing with that 
is they don't always hold people accountable, right? And the assumption that transparency is going to lead to accountability um, is a false assumption. Uh, it doesn't necessarily lead to accountability and it depends to who you think you're being accountable. Um, and the correlation that we're making, I mean, so, so what we're able to show is that a chief's level of trust in those three various um, groups, right? So either citizens, their own organization, or the media will affect their willingness to share footage. Um, and, you know, there's a statistical correlation that demonstrates that um, based on these experiments. Um, these are part of a much larger project that we're doing. Uh, so we have 5,000 citizens that we've also surveyed. We have another thousand police chiefs that we've also surveyed. Um, you know, so there, there's kind of a longer story here. And I think more than anything, the story is uh, accountability is a relationship, right? And there's an assumption that um, we always know what that relationship is. But I think, as I mentioned earlier, that police chief may have an accountable relationship with, um, you know, the justice system and make sure that the body worn cameras are done in such a way that they are abiding their legal requirements, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to disclose them to the public. And in certain cases, maybe they shouldn't disclose them to the public. Uh, so, so I think we put so much weight into these tools as being a silver bullet. Um, and ultimately they are just one piece of a puzzle that is much more complicated. Another question came in from Carla. Uh, it says, does the trust issue change depending upon what the footage is? Yeah, it's a great question. I can't answer it because, um, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't lay out any other scenarios as of now. Um, you know, we do have footage of non-fatal police encounters. Um, and it very well may shift it. Um, so that's kind of a next stage of our research is to, is to test some of that. Um, so it's possible. Any other questions for Dan? Okay, well, with that, I just want to, um, you know, thank everyone for jumping on. I appreciate it. Um, you, you all have my email address. It should be posted up there. I don't know if, um, Candace, we send it out with, with this. I'll, uh, we can follow up with that and some information about the program too. Yeah. Um, but if you're interested, you know, in the research, um, you know, by all means, feel free to reach out. Um, and if you're interested in the program, same thing, um, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm listed on the Carsey school website. Um, you're more than welcome to, uh, send any questions. There you go. Candace just threw it in the chat box. Um, so thank you once again. It's a pleasure, um, you know, talking with everyone and I hope you all have a great day and stay safe and try to enjoy this the best that you can at this point. Take care.